Okay, I think we could go ahead and start now. So um, welcome everybody to this uh, special NHGRI Zoom session, um, uh, which was organized to give uh, folks a chance to hear about a, a very uh, special event and honor uh, involving uh, our former scientific director, Dan Casper. Um, I'm just gonna make some brief remarks, turn it over to Dan, and then if people have questions, you just put them in, we'll have a moderated Q&A session. You could put questions in the Q&A and, um, and Paul Liu is on board as well. He's gonna moderate that discussion. But um, what, one thing I would say is one of the really gratifying um, experiences I had uh, uh, since bringing Dan Kastner over from NIAMS to NHGRI when he joined us as our scientific director um, was really just being able to sit back, uh, as you all know, I'm a baseball fan, just sit back and watch Dan and his group hit home run after home run after home run um, in terms of publication, scientific accomplishments, and then watch the accolades come in and the honors come in. And it was just, um, it was just so gratifying to watch and it made NHGRI just so proud uh, to see all of those things. Of course, we knew what we were getting when we brought Dan over. Um, even at that point, um, he was a member of the National Academy of Sciences at that point. Since then, he became a member of the National Academy of Medicine. Um, most recently, I think many of you remember, he was Federal Employee of the Year in 2018, but he also has a list of many other honors and honorific lectures and various other um, uh, accolades uh, bestowed upon him, including the Ross Prize in Molecular Medicine in 2019. Um, but then I think completely surprising to Dan was a phone call that he'll probably tell you about um, that came uh, with an unidentified number um, that I would have never answered the phone because I almost never answer the phone if I can't identify the number. But this is an example where it's probably a good idea every once in a while to take a phone call from somebody and just assume it's not a telemarketer. Um, and indeed it wasn't. And he learned that he had been selected for this thing called the Crawford Prize. Um, which I want to point out to you, he's going to tell you much more about it, but you know, this is not, these prizes are not just all about science. They give them out in different thematic areas, mathematics, astronomy, polyarthritis, and geosciences. Um, and um, I don't think it was uh, something that Dan saw coming. And so I think that almost made it all the more pleasurable. And it came with an immense amount of, 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 of um, pride in part because of the incredible honor and also because it comes with some money that he could actually accept. Ultimately, we would get approval for that. And it also came with a very nice trip uh, uh, that he was able to take to Sweden. So this is so special and so novel um, that um, Dan put a PowerPoint presentation together to be able to summarize it. And I know he's been meeting with various groups who are interested in hearing about this, um, including this uh, um, group assembled here uh, uh, through Zoom. Um, and, uh, involving NHGRI staff. And I should also point out, I'm sure Dan will, 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 will fill in some details. This whole thing all happened in the pandemic. It kept getting delayed exactly when he was gonna be able to go there, this, that, and the other. So it also got drawn out over what seemed like a long period of time, but it finally came to fruition. And I know it was a very um, enjoyable and remarkably rewarding trip for Dan and we wanna hear all about it. So with that, I'm gonna congratulate Dan once again on this incredible honor, tell him how proud all of us are and now we just want to hear about your, your ticker tape parade through Sweden. Well, Eric, thank you so, so much for that really kind, kind introduction. And I have to say, you know, that with this sort of thing, it, it is uh, perhaps a recognition of me, but it is even more so a recognition of all of the people who uh, work with me and my uh, laboratory and clinical team. It's a, a uh, real endorsement of, of the environment uh, that we have uh, in the intramural program and particularly in the intramural program of uh, NHGRI. Uh, the support uh, that I've had over the years has been absolutely uh, wonderful and extraordinary. And I have to really start out by just giving a big thank you uh, to you, Eric, and to all of my colleagues in NHGRI and across uh, the intramural program of, of the NIH and, and more broadly too. We certainly have a number of collaborators uh, elsewhere. As Eric said, uh, this uh, prize was a total shock. 
uh, to me uh, when it came in. And basically uh, what happened was that this was uh, back in uh, early uh, 2020 uh, when uh, uh, when I got the call, let's see, was it early 2020? I guess it was early 2020. Um, no, early 2021. You see, I've, <laughs> I've forgotten. Uh, but in any case, uh, we were in the height of the pandemic mode at that point, And I was actually doing a clinical team meeting from home. It was a Wednesday afternoon. And as Eric said, uh, the, the phone uh, rang. And uh, as had been the habit of my wife, who's also uh, an NIH employee and was working from home uh, as well. Uh, we got so many telemarketer calls that we would just, when the landline uh, would ring, we would uh, uh, answer it, but then quickly hang up. And so I did this, you know, like three times of, you know, the person kept calling and I kept hanging up. And then Margaret took over and, and uh, dished out a couple of more hangups uh, before finally uh, realizing that this person was very persistent and uh, must have something that they wanted to, to talk to us about. Uh, she actually answered the phone and it was a Dr. Dan Larhammer, whom uh, Margaret had never heard of at that point, uh, from Sweden. He didn't introduce himself in, in terms of being associated with the Crawford Prize or the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. He just said he was Dr. Larhammer and he needed to talk with Dr. Kastner um, soon, urgently. Uh, and uh, my wife said, well, he's in a meeting and, and can I take a message and so forth. So anyway, uh, at first uh, I had said, well, I'll, I'll talk with him, you know, after my meetings are over today, uh, which would be like at five o'clock in the afternoon, but that would be like 11 o'clock at night in Sweden. So I, I thought better of that and actually uh, played hooky from the Wednesday afternoon lecture series. To, uh, to take his call and then learn that in fact, I had won this thing, the Crawford Prize, um, which I knew about. Uh, I knew about the Crawford Prize. I didn't know that I was going to win the Crawford Prize. Um, and I was just totally dumbfounded, I must say. It was just an incredible uh, shock uh, when I uh, learned about that. So anyway, so this is the story of what happened uh, since then. I'll just start out maybe by telling you a little bit about the guy after whom uh, the Crawford Prize uh, is named. Uh, and that is uh, Holger Crawford. And actually uh, uh, the prize is named after Holger and uh, Anna Greta Crawford. And it's pronounced Crawford. There's no W in it. So to pronounce it properly, it's the Crawford Prize, not the Crawford Prize. Um, and uh, Holger Crawford uh, was uh, uh, a uh, business executive, uh, basically. He had, had been raised in Sweden uh, by a single mother. Uh, he had gone to uh, the uh, Swedish School of Economics, where he graduated first in his class, and he became, at a fairly young age, the CEO of some company called uh, Ackerland and Rousing, uh, which is a packaging company. Uh, and shortly after he took this job as the CEO of the company, he came up with this idea for packaging milk in tetrahedral paper uh, containers, uh, which apparently had never been done before. Uh, and he called this the Tetra Pack. Uh, and founded a company called Tetra Pak uh, in 1950 and made lots and lots of money from Tetra Pak. And uh, by the mid 1960s, uh, he had decided that he wanted to move on. He spoke uh, with this guy here, uh, whose name is Nils, his name was Nils Alwal, uh, who was a physician in Lund, Sweden. This is where the packaging company was and, and where Holger Crawford was. And uh, Nils Alwal uh, had this idea for starting uh, hemodialysis. And, and back at that time, hemodialysis was not something that was uh, practicable. He developed the dialysis machine and uh, Holger Crawford underwrote uh, the company uh, called Gambro. Uh, that uh, made dialysis machines. And so Holger Crawford made a lot of money from that too. So uh, in 1980, he's, he established this prize, the Crawford Prize. Uh, and he did this in partnership with the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Um, 
And basically the Royal Swedish Academy is, is responsible for selecting the uh, prize winners. Uh, and now here, you know, you'll chuckle, but uh, the prize is awarded on a rotating basis and disciplines chosen to complement those in which the Nobel Prize is, award, is awarded, astronomy and mathematics, geosciences, biosciences with an emphasis on ecology and polyarthritis. Now, you might think that the first ones, astronomy, mathematics, geosciences, uh, and biosciences, uh, maybe they are in, a calib in the same caliber as physics and chemistry and the other things for which the Nobel Prize is awarded. But polyarthritis? I mean, granted, I'm a rheumatologist, but even I would admit that that's a little bit of a stretch. Uh, to have a Nobel Prize equivalent uh, in polyarthritis. But don't look a gift horse in the mouth uh, with regard to these kinds of things. And, and actually, Holger Crawford had a, uh, a reason for doing that, and that is that he suffered from rheumatoid arthritis in his later years, and he uh, perceived that uh, medical progress, at least back at that time in the uh, early 1980s, was not very good uh, in uh, developing treatments for rheumatoid arthritis. And as a beginning rheumatology fellow back at that time, I can say that that was true. So, so in any case, uh, there were these prizes. The polyarthritis prize actually was only to be given if there was some progress in the field. In other words, it was not a regular thing that uh, there would be a polyarthritis prize. They had to have a special committee that would decide that that there had been sufficient progress uh, to do that. And, and in fact, there was no polyarthritis prize for virtually the first 20 years of the Crawford prizes because they felt that there hadn't been sufficient progress. But in any case, so the, the prize uh, entails 6 million Swedish kroner, which is a lot of money in US dollars too. It's over $600,000, so it's, it's a lot of money. Um, and some of the past laureates, I won't read off all of them, but some of them that you might recognize, James Van Allen, the person who discovered the Van Allen belts, uh, E.O. Wilson, who many of you may have heard of uh, uh, at Harvard, uh, uh, and Carl Woese, uh, who uh, discovered the Archaea, uh, the separate uh, uh, kingdom uh, in uh, phylogeny. So a number of uh, fairly prominent people have uh, won the uh, Crawford Prize in other fields. In polyarthritis, actually, the first of the uh, prizes that was given in polyarthritis was in 2000. And the first Crawford Prize at all was given in 1982. So it was almost 20 years. Uh, and that was given to Sir Ravinder Maney and Sir Mark Feldman, uh, who were the two individuals who uh, first uh, had the idea of using inhibitors of TNF, tumor necrosis factor, for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, which was a revolutionary thing and, and warranted a prize, whether it was the Crawford Prize or whatever. That was a, a major change in the field of rheumatology. And subsequently, there have been prizes that have been given uh, with regard to uh, adhesion molecules, um, cytokines, uh, the role of HLA and environmental factors in rheumatoid arthritis susceptibility and uh, regulatory T cells. So uh, that's a little bit of the background uh, on the Crawford Prize. Uh, just to give you a little bit of an idea of why did they think that maybe I was uh, worthy of the Crawford Prize? Well, they, they gave the Crawford Prize this year, the 2021 Crawford Prize, uh, for establishing the concept of autoinflammatory diseases. And so some of you will say, well, what's that? Uh, so at least as we first proposed them, uh, these are a group of disorders that are characterized by episodes of seemingly unprovoked inflammation, but without the autoantibodies or antigen-specific T cells that you'd see in the characteristic autoimmune diseases. Um, so sort of uh, diseases where there's unexplained non-infection caused, not malignancy caused inflammation, but where you don't have the usual uh, features of, of autoimmunity. And we now know that these are disorders of the innate immune system. Uh, the autoimmune diseases are more 
disorders of the adaptive immune system, whereas the auto-inflammatory disorders are more disorders of the innate immune system. And I'll explain that a little bit more as we go along. Just to put it in some sort of historical perspective, actually in the early 1900s, Paul Ehrlich, uh, who was uh, an immunologist, one of the founders, I guess, of the field of immunology, and who won uh, the Nobel Prize in Medicine back in, I think it was 1908, uh, proposed that there, was, there could be no such thing as autoimmune diseases or diseases where the immune system would attack the host because the immune system is so potent that it would be uh, fatal. Uh, and he called that uh, idea horror autotoxicus, you know, the terrible things that would happen to the host if the immune system turned on the host. By the 1950s, it became clear that in fact there were autoimmune diseases and that in fact diseases like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis and thyroiditis in those diseases that you could actually develop anti antibodies against your own tissue and, and have real pathology and not necessarily die from it, although some people obviously would die from that. Uh, and then in 2000, another 50 years later, was when we proposed this concept of autoinflammatory diseases. So, so it's taken a while for this concept uh, to evolve. In terms of the how it happened for us, and this is boiled down to one slide, uh, there's the three stages of discovery that I'll uh, uh, mention to you. The first stage uh, was from 1989 to 1999, and that was the time uh, when my research group was trying to, and ultimately did, uh, find the gene mutated in familial Mediterranean fever uh, by positional cloning. And at that time, at least in the, the world of rheumatology, there was a lot of skepticism about the, the genome project. And, and in fact, of course, there wasn't even a genome institute, at least initially, uh, when we uh, set underway. And the idea of familial Mediterranean fever, which is a relatively rare disease, uh, where patients uh, uh, have a recessively inherited disorder where they get recurrent fevers and arthritis and severe abdominal pain and sometimes uh, severe chest pain and can develop kidney failure from it. Um, it was th thought that that was sort of a, not a very relevant disease to be studying. And so some said that we were uh, using an unproven method to study an irrelevant disease, but we persisted and, and ultimately did find the gene. And it turned out that that gene encodes a protein that had not been known before and, and turns out to be sort of the prototype for a number of other proteins involved in inflammation. And then a couple of years later, we kept seeing patients you know, with, with unexplained recurrent fevers. And we found that there were some of them that didn't have mutations in that gene. They had the mutations in another gene, the TNF receptor. And so we called that condition TNF receptor associated periodic syndrome or TRAPS. Uh, and then at that point, a light went on and we figured that, well, there's two of these diseases, both of them um, inherited disorders in which patients have recurrent fevers and inflammation and no autoantibodies. And so this is the basis for a new family of diseases. And so we proposed this idea of autoinflammatory disease. And then uh, during the epiphany stage, you know, which sort of began at the point where we figured that out, uh, we started to sort of... Uh, 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 refine the concept of autoinflammatory disease and to think about all of the other diseases besides the ones that we had described uh, that might fit under the rubric of autoinflammatory. And so we had a long list. We, we published a paper you know, with this long list of diseases that we thought were autoinflammatory. Um, and then within a year after that, after that happened, another group in San Diego, Hal Hoffman's group in San Diego, discovered the gene that's mutated in a couple of those diseases that we said you know, were auto-inflammatory and were somehow related to FMF and TRAMPS, he found the gene that's mutated in a couple of those diseases, and lo and behold, that gene encodes a protein that has a domain that uh, is in common with the FMF gene. And so actually there was a connection there. And what's more, uh, through work that was going on in basic science at the time, 
that gene encodes a protein that's a regulator for IL-1. And so we and other people had the idea of treating these patients with those diseases with IL-1 inhibitors. And it was miraculous. These patients, some of whom had terrible disease, children with uh, one of the variants of it who developed meningitis, aseptic meningitis, they go blind, they go deaf, they develop intellectual disability. A lot of them die in adolescence. All of a sudden, it was like their inflammation went away. We have kids that started on IL-1 inhibition at that time who are now graduating from college. It's incredible. It makes you believe in molecular medicine. So that's the second phase, the epiphany stage. And then the third stage, we say a little bit whimsically, is the horror autoinflammaticus stage. So rather than horror autotoxicus, horror autoinflammaticus stage. Uh, and so that's from 2009 to the present. And given the wonderful advances in genomics and DNA sequencing and all of the things that we can do, now you know we have like over 50 autoinflammatory diseases. Uh, we recognize now somatic mutations, can cause autoinflammation. So really uh, just a lot of fun. Uh, so it's been great. Uh, and whether there was a Crawford Prize or not, I've had a wonderful time doing all of this. Um, and so there was a Crawford Prize and ultimately uh, we ended up going to Sweden, uh, my wife and I, and actually we brought along uh, some of our families uh, on both sides of the family uh, in uh, late April. And so because of all of the, the postponements with the pandemics, the pandemic, they had saved up actually four Crawford Prizes to be given at the same time. Usually they do one at a time uh, on a rotating basis each year. It's a, a different discipline. But they had saved up mathematics, astronomy, polyarthritis, and geosciences, all to be done at the same time, which was wonderful because it really then did make it like it was a smorgasbord of science that we were going to uh, over at the end of April. So we flew over to uh, Sweden. Uh, actually, we flew to Denmark, and then you take a, uh, uh, a car across the bridge uh, to Sweden. Uh, and uh, we did that on um, a Friday evening, and I forget what it was, uh, maybe the 22nd or something like that of, of, uh, of April, and got to this place here that you can see called the Grand Hotel of Lund. Uh, so, so we checked in uh, to the Grand Hotel of Lund uh, on Saturday. Now, uh, Lund is actually a beautiful historic city. This is uh, the inside of a cathedral in Lund, uh, which is almost 900 years old at this point that, that you can see if you visit Lund. Uh, but actually, I wasn't visiting uh, the sites of Lund because I was uh, under, you know, strict um, restraints, uh, you know, because of NIH travel uh, policy. And so, you know, as as it turned out, uh, you know, the the events of the Crawford days started on Monday. I flew over on a Friday because the Crawford people said I should be there on Saturday, but actually they didn't have anything for me to do in terms of events. They thought that maybe one would want to tour Lund, but you know, I had to have meetings scheduled for the Saturday and the Sunday so that you know, it could justify my being there. So I contacted this guy, Frank Volheim, uh, who's a rheumatologist in Lund, who's writing a book on his mentor, Jan Voldenstrom, uh, who's since passed away, the Voldenstrom of Voldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, it's a kind of blood cancer. And so we met on Saturday night to talk about this biography of Voldenstrom that he's writing. And then I had some other things I had to do for uh, a rheumatology meeting in Florida that I had to log on to from my hotel room. So in any case, uh, my family went and toured Lund, uh, and I talked with Frank Wilhelm, which was very nice. He's a delightful guy. Um, but in any case, and then uh, Sunday evening, uh, we had a family dinner. And as you can see, there actually were a lot of family members that took us up on the offer uh, to, uh, to go over to Sweden. Uh, so we had a big dinner uh, on, uh, on Sunday evening. And then the next morning uh, was the beginning of the, uh, the proceedings, the Crawford Prize uh, lectures and whatnot. 
Uh, so this was being held in the grand auditorium of the Lux building uh, at Lund uh, University. And here I am uh, before the, the actual lectures began, and I'm uh, there with Ricard Holmdahl and Ole Kempke, uh, and they were two uh, members, Ole actually is the chair of the uh, committee that chooses uh, the Crawford Prize members, uh, Crawford Prize winners in polyarthritis. They're both rheumatologists at the Karolinska Institute uh, in Stockholm and actually are uh, also members of, of the committee that chooses the Nobel Prize uh, in physiology or medicine. They were very impressed with the NIH, let me just say, uh, because uh, they uh, remarked upon uh, the letters that they had to write uh, indicating that, uh, in fact, the money that I might get uh, was not for giving a couple of lectures at this meeting, uh, but in fact uh, was in recognition of, of uh, my work. Uh, but they, they certainly were impressed that the NIH has a, a real set of standards with regard to that. And just parenthetically, I'd like to thank Ellen Rolfus for helping to move things along uh, with regard to that process, and Leonard Ross uh, for everything that he did to help move uh, the approval process uh, along as well. In any case, uh, once we had some coffee, uh, then we had a series of, of lectures. So the first of the lectures was by Enrico uh, Bomberi uh, uh, from uh, the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. Uh, he gave the mathematics lecture. And for those of you who actually want these slides, you can have the slides and then you can click on the link and you could actually listen to Professor Bombieri's uh, lecture. But let me just tell you that it was very complicated, and I don't think that there were many people in the auditorium that understood very much of what he had to say. He's a very nice man, I, I must say that, uh, but uh, I didn't understand a lot of it. Uh, he talked about his work on prime numbers. Uh, a lot of his work over the course of his career uh, has been on number theory. Um, and he is a very prominent mathematician. Uh, when he was a young man, he won the Field Medal. Uh, which is another big prize uh, in mathematics. I'm not going to go through, I, I tried to think of, you know, a little snippet of his talk that I could, you know, just play so that you could get a sense of it, but I failed. I just couldn't come up with anything. This, this slide simply shows the beginning of his lecture. He read his lecture in 1859, the epoch-making paper by Riemann on the zeta function appeared, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but in any case, uh, it was, uh, something, uh, anyway. So then the second prize uh, was the Astronomy Prize. And that prize uh, was awarded to Eugene Parker. Uh, this was actually the 2020 Astronomy Prize, as was the Mathematics Prize that was for 2020 as well. And so this went to Eugene Parker, but unfortunately, uh, uh, Eugene Parker, who's a, who was a professor emeritus at the University of Chicago, passed away about a month or so before this event happened, and he had been in ill health uh, anyway. So instead, uh, uh, the person who gave a lecture in, uh, in place of, of Eugene Parker uh, was this person here, Nikki Fox, uh, who uh, is the director of the NASA Heliophysics Science Division, and very considerable person, and it was really an enjoyable uh, lecture to listen to. Uh, you can see that she's got this uh, t-shirt on uh, that is the Parker Space Probe. Uh, she actually is the person that's in charge of the mission. Uh, they launched a, uh, a space probe to measure various uh, radiation coming out of the sun. It orbits the sun uh, between uh, just outside of Venus and then on the other side around the sun. And it goes in successively smaller orbits so that eventually it will burn up. But uh, at least right now it's still functioning. But I thought that uh, it would be fun at least to uh, listen to her a little bit in terms of some of the things she had to say. Um, so, uh, as as the uh, intro introduction said, um, I am the director of NASA's Heliophysics Division, and as such, I get to uh, 
to actually manage and look after a lot of missions, uh, 20 um, that are actually up, up in orbit right now and another 14 that are in development, all of which are really studying science that was driven by Dr. Eugene Parker. And so uh, heliophysics is indeed the study of the sun, our closest star, everything from the very, very center of the star all the way out to the very edge of its influence and indeed beyond. And so here you see a very familiar looking planet, the Earth, and uh, you can see that our magnetic field is protecting us from all of these this stuff coming from the sun. If uh, we go up and I take you to the poles of the sun, you can look down on the poles and you will see that atmosphere starting to uh, spread away in a spiral shape, that spiral known as the Parker spiral, because of course Jean predicted that would happen. Um, then we go to the very edge. So this is now the very edge of our sun's influence. This is where the solar wind stops and it meets interstellar space. This is yet another prediction of uh, Gene Parker that in fact our solar wind would form a protective cavity around not just our planet and our star but our whole solar system. So as we are orbiting around the Milky Way, the solar wind actually protects us from the vagaries of interstellar space, from particles, from dust, from cosmic rays coming from us. And so we have a pretty nice life here because of the solar wind. But in 1958, using, and this is in Gene's own words, he solved four lines of algebra. That is how Eugene Parker described finding the solar wind. He actually said to me, all I did was, was solve four equations. So he solved four lines of algebra and, and you know, it was all uh, predicated on the Beerman study of the, the comets, which was so beautifully described to us. Um, Beerman was actually visiting Chicago and he was meeting with John Simpson, who was uh, Gene's boss at the time. And he presented exactly what you just saw, that the comet tails were always pointing away from the sun. And he actually said, well, there must be something moving out. It's some sort of, he called it corpuscular radiation. Now, John Simpson kind of dismissed it out of hand and said, you know, maybe something comes out occasionally, but it's not coming out all of the time. And he also cited a famous scientist at the time, Sidney Chapman, who had said that much like the Earth's atmosphere, the sun's atmosphere would be static. And so John Simpson, you know, had dismissed everything, but he passed all the work on to Gene Parker and said, see what you think about this. So Gene studied it. He solved his four lines of algebra and he came up with um, different sort of solutions for, for these four lines of algebra, five of which were physically not possible, but the sixth one was. And I'm, I'm actually going to, I don't usually use notes, but I want to make sure I get this quote right, because I love this. This is from a paper by Kane in 2009. So Gene uh, Parker went to John Simpson and said, John, Beerman is right and Chapman is wrong. So John Simpson said, Eugene, what is your basis for saying this? Well, my calculations show that the sun's atmosphere is not only not static, but it's highly dynamic. And with millions of degrees of coronal temperatures, the whole place would be boiling and some flow would come out, sometimes more, sometimes less, but never zero. And I, Eugene Parker, would like to call it solar wind. So John Simpson said, so what do you propose to do? Write a paper or something? Gene said, well, yes, unless the university prohibits it. John Simpson replied, no, 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 no. We're very open-minded here. Do what you like, publish what you like, but for heaven's sake, don't put my name on it. <laughs> Wonder if he ever regretted that. <laughs> so, so several journals did indeed reject this paper, uh, but, but luckily um, the, uh, an editor did intervene. But uh, one of the, the referees went so far as to actually say, if you're going to publish in this area of science, you might want to go to the library first. And Gene told me this and he said, oh, Nikki, that was the nice review. <laughs> so fortunately, uh, the editor was Chandra Sakar, um, who uh, was also at the University of Chicago. And he was, uh, you know, really kind of enjoyed the, uh, the controversy. And he said, Eugene, I think this is a ridiculous idea, but I don't want to see it killed, so I'll publish it. 
And certainly, Jean got a lot of, of you know, maybe ridicule is too strong a word, but a lot of pushback and a lot of, goodness, what is all this about from colleagues. But then just a few years later, in 1962, the Mariner 2 spacecraft on its way out to Venus did indeed sense the exact solar wind that Jean had predicted. And so the rest is kind of history. Uh, but uh, one of my favorite comments that Jean made was, you know, if you do something new or innovative, you should expect trouble. All right. Well, anyway, moving on, then I gave my talk on auto-inflammatory diseases. You've already heard at least the essence of it. Here I am delivering it. Uh, this is just a slide that uh, is a note, actually, that I wrote on the very first patient that I saw with familial Mediterranean fever as a fellow uh, at the NIH in 1985. Uh, then um, uh, eight years, eight years, 12 years later, uh, when we found the gene uh, for FMF by uh, positional cloning, cloning uh, uh, just a schematic of, of uh, how we went about doing that, the fact that uh, the gene in fact encodes uh, what was then a novel protein, and of course, everybody very happy uh, to have uh, made it uh, to that point. And I might add that uh, with the advent of uh, the NHGRI, or as it was called, the NCHGR, uh, at that time, uh, it really uh, made a big difference for us in terms of being able to, to uh, find the gene. Uh, it turned out that uh, the N-terminal 90 or so amino acids of that uh, protein uh, uh, form a domain that's found in some 20 different proteins that are involved in the innate uh, immune system. And then uh, shortly thereafter, a couple of years thereafter, uh, we, after we found the gene for FMF, we didn't know about this domain right away. Uh, but um, shortly after we found the gene for FMF, we found the second gene and proposed this concept of auto-inflammatory syndromes. A year or so later, published the paper in which we uh, suggested that perhaps these two diseases, familial cold urticaria and muckle well syndrome, were somehow related to familial Mediterranean fever. It turned out that then uh, a year after that, Hal Hoffman in San Diego showed that, in fact, the gene that's mutated in those two diseases share that N-terminal uh, domain uh, with uh, the FMF protein. That in turn led to the uh, insights with regard to IL-1, and this is the publication uh, in uh, 2006 of the paper in which we showed that in fact IL-1 inhibition is absolutely transformative for patients that have uh, the uh, neurologic uh, manifestations of this uh, condition. And then the two flavors of immunity, adaptive immunity where T and B cells uh, are the major players, the receptors somatically rearrange and mutate, and the autoimmune diseases are characterized by high titer autoantibodies or antigen specific T cells and the innate immune system, which was just beginning to be recognized at the time that these auto-inflammatory diseases were popping up. Uh, and in these, in the innate immune system, uh, myeloid lineage cells are the major effectors. The receptors are hardwired in the germline genome and the auto-inflammatory diseases uh, show inflammation, unprovoked inflammation, but without the autoantibodies or antigen specific T cells. Then with the, uh, the cost of sequencing coming down dramatically, this is a, an NHGRI slide, uh, we were able, and others, many others, were able to find additional uh, diseases, discover additional diseases in which there are mutations in genes that encode uh, either structural proteins in the innate immune system or regulatory proteins in the innate immune system. In this particular case, uh, discovering um, mutations in the ADA2 gene in children that have recurrent fevers and strokes. That led subsequently to the discovery of uh, TNF inhibitors as a way of preventing strokes in these kids, which was really a big deal uh, at that time. Mandy Umbrello uh, uh, led those studies. And then this is just a list of, of the various uh, genes and diseases that we've discovered over the years. Uh, at least the ones that we've had a major role, and there's 16 of them altogether. 14 of them actually are, are diseases that didn't exist at the time that we started that were 
recognized, at least as a part of doing this work. These are all monogenic diseases, and then there are a number of genetically complex disorders uh, where we've also been uh, interested in defining some of the susceptibility loci. So that was that talk. Uh, and then the last talk of the day was Andrew Knoll. Uh, and Andrew Knoll uh, is a uh, professor of natural history uh, uh, in the uh, Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Harvard. Uh, and he got his uh, Crawford Prize in Geosciences for the work that he had done uh, characterizing uh, the first three billion years of life on Earth and its interactions with the physical environment. And that was a fascinating talk as well. So basically, uh, he started uh, from the standpoint of going back as far as you could in the fossil record of animals, and then trying to figure out, well, what was, what was life like on Earth before uh, those fossils were, uh, were developed? Uh, and so I'll just play a little bit of his talk uh, for you. I'd like to take just a minute to put that animal record, in fact, the animal kingdom in, in perspective uh, in both uh, time and space. And if you look at that uh, diagram in the upper left, it represents an effort by my friend Ron Milo in Tel Aviv and his colleagues to quantify the amount of biomass in different groups of organisms. And what you can see what they come up with here is that a majority of the biomass on this planet is actually plants, with bacteria next, and then fungi, then archaea, another group of microorganisms uh, uh, distinct from, but organizationally similar to bacteria, and then protozoans and algae, and the little box in the corner is animals, much less than 1% of all the biomass on this planet. It turns out that plants actually cheat in that if you go outside and actually look carefully at one of the trees that surrounds us, you'll find that more than 90% of its mass is not living tissue. Wood does not become functional until the cells that created it die. So if you only include the living tissues of plants, then we live in a bacterial world with plants second, and animals are still a very small part of it. Then let's go to the diagram beneath that, which is what's called a universal phylogeny. It is an attempt using molecular sequence comparisons to build really a genealogy that depicts the evolutionary relationships of all life. Um, uncontroversially, it suggests that there are three major categories of life, the bacteria, the eukaryotes, which are organisms like ourselves that have a membrane-bounded nucleus, and then a group only really discovered to be distinct in 1977 called the archaea, which is organized in a simple way like a bacterial cell, but is in fact quite distinct. That diagram shows the eukaryotes as being a sister group to the archaea, uh, through work done over the last seven years, some of it done in Sweden, uh, we actually now think that the eukaryotic cell represents a merger between a recently discovered group of archaea and uh, some cells from the bacteria. In any event, the reason for showing this is that no matter how you look at this uh, set of genealogical relationships, all of the animals, both living and in the fossil record, reside on one small distal branch of the tree. And the inference from that is that there must be a deeper history of life than that represented by animal fossils. And that deeper history would be largely microbial. Then finally, if we look at the uh, right-hand diagram, it's simply a geologic timeline. Uh, the oldest evidence for animals that we have from the fossil record uh, goes back about 575 million years. But our planet is more than four and a half billion years old. And so the question that I'll uh, address today is what can we learn about this long interval of Earth history that precedes the advent of large fossilizable animals? Okay, let me then finish up then. The, the punchline, of course, is that we, can, we actually can reconstruct the deep history, both physical and biological, of our own planet, 
and now in the last 20 years of other planets as well, that there are not only reconstructable histories of life and environment, but clearly life and the environment have interacted through Earth history, and so that major biological transitions both track and I think help to drive environmental changes in our planet's history. And this is something that continues. Uh, these are just four panels of uh, changes just over the, during the age of animals over the last 500 million years. Most of you know that Earth is characterized by plate tectonics, so the actual geome or geography of the Earth changes through time. This is what the Earth looked like about 250 million years ago at the time of that great mass extinction that Daniel talked about. And it's about as, as different from our present Earth's surface as it can be, that nearly all the continents are amalgamated into a supercontinent, and there is a global ocean that's more than a hemisphere in extent. We know that atmospheric composition continues to change, in particular the amount of carbon dioxide has changed through time. We know that climate has changed through time. This is just a, a drawing of what the Earth looked like 20,000 years ago, when you have ice extending south in North America to about Long Island, covering uh, Scandinavia, things like that. And there's a series of ice ages through time. And every once in a while, bad things happen on short time scales. This is 66 million years ago. Here are two dinosaurs out on what will surely be their last date. And there's looking at this thing uh, going on, which in fact, as, as many of you know, was an 11 kilometer bolide that crashed into the earth in the Yucatan Peninsula and precipitated uh, a major extinction. And one has to point out that we are not living in a static time ourselves. In fact, the evolutionary present is on a geologic time scale, a time of very rapid environmental change. I love these diagrams put together by a guy named Jim Barry at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. This is not the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, but the rate of change of CO2 over the last 400,000 years. And it's boring, it's boring, it's boring, it's boring, it's boring, it's boring, and then the industrial age starts and it gets really interesting. Here is the pH, rate of pH change in the ocean. It wiggles around and again, this is the, the phenomenon called ocean acidification, that the pH of the oceans has changed dramatically. And that is really the context that in which we and our children and grandchildren will live. And I, I think that by incorporating the lessons of Earth's past, perhaps we'll be wise enough to deal uh, intelligently with its future. Well, hopefully so. Uh, so that was the uh, the last of the lectures uh, for the Crawford Prize uh, Symposium. Um, uh, I then uh, went out to dinner with uh, some of the, the people uh, from my lab, from the early days of, of the lab, uh, at least a, a, a number of them. Uh, so Mike McDermott, who was involved in the identification of TNF receptor mutations and traps, uh, Ivona Aksentievich, who's uh, been uh, with our uh, research team for nearly since the very beginning, Ilone Pross, who was also one of the early fellows, who's now uh, the head of a Genomics Institute uh, in Tel Aviv and his wife, Orit, uh, and uh, Elaine Remmers. The next morning then, uh, so this was, this was really a lot of science uh, that we had uh, during this uh, event. Uh, we had uh, a set of four parallel symposia having to do with the topics that each of the prize winners had. So, so there was a symposium in uh, polyarthritis, a symposium uh, in the geosciences, a symposium in uh, mathematics, and a symposium in astronomy. Uh, I'll just uh, uh, play you a short clip uh, from the beginning of the quality of Friday's meeting that I was attending. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Crawford Prize Symposium in Polyarthritis. And the theme of today is Autoinflammatory Diseases. My name is Hans Eldegren. I'm Secretary General of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. The mission 
of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences uh, prioritize four areas. The first two is to support uh, science for policy and to influence the policy for science. The other two is that we want to be a meeting place for science and also to promote and award scientific excellence. It is the two latter aims that we are here for today. Uh, the Academy's two most prominent prizes are the Nobel Prize and the Creffold Prize. We award the Nobel Prize in Chemistry and Physics and the Prize in Economy to the memory of Alfred Nobel. We award the five Crawford Prizes in Astronomy, Biosciences, Geosciences, in Mathematics, and, and that's of course the reason we're here today, in Polyarthritis. I hope that you will find this symposium rewarding. Uh, I really wish you a great day. Uh, I know it will be followed by, by a dinner tonight, uh, so there will be plenty of opportunity to talk to each other today. And uh, by that, I leave the word to Professor Ole Kempe, who will introduce the prize winner. So have a nice day. All right, well, I've already been introduced, so you don't need that. Uh, and uh, my talk, uh, which was to a more specialist audience, uh, dealt with some of the more recent things that uh, our research group has done. I won't go through those uh, in detail with you, uh, uh, just to flip through uh, uh, the slides of uh, my talk anyway. And then there were eight other speakers uh, that spoke. This was a day-long symposium. Uh, Mo Lam Camphy talking about the inflammasome, uh, Harold Burkhardt talking about uh, uh, psoriasis and its relationship to autoinflammation, Yannick Crow talking about the interferonopathies, Nils Landergren talking about autoimmune diseases as a uh, counterpoint to autoinflammatory diseases, uh, Elaine Rammers talked about uh, her work on the genetics of Bechet's disease. Claudia Kemper from uh, NHLBI talking about intracellular complement. Yinan Bryson uh, talking about macrophage activation syndrome uh, and uh, uh, lymphocyte cytotoxicity. And uh, Jean-Laurent Casanova, who many of you may think of as being more of someone involved in immunodeficiency diseases, which he is, uh, but actually he has uh, also uh, a fairly uh, significant interest in the autoinflammatory diseases as well. And this is just a picture of uh, uh, the people that I showed you uh, earlier on the, uh, the dinner uh, photo uh, a few slides ago. And then the third day was actually the day of pomp and circumstance. And so we can go through this relatively quickly. This was uh, held in the assembly hall at Lund University. Here's a picture of my wife, Margaret, and me. Uh, beforehand, they made us rehearse so that we would do everything uh, according to schedule. Uh, they had uh, books that uh, each of us would sign. There was a book for the uh, mathematics uh, prize. This is uh, Dr. Bombieri signing that. Uh, the, the children of uh, Eugene Parker signing uh, uh, in his memory uh, in the uh, astronomy book. Here I am uh, signing in the polyarthritis book and actually revealing that I don't have nearly as much hair on top of my head as what I usually think. Um, and then uh, here is the crown princess Victoria, uh, who is the person who uh, gave out the awards talking with Ebba Fisher, who's the granddaughter of uh, Holger Crawford uh, and uh, the chair of the uh, Crawford Foundation board. Uh, then just a photo of, of uh, some of the uh, various people that were involved in this. This is Dan Larhammer, the guy that I was hanging up on uh, at the beginning of the story, and Hans, uh, Hans uh, Elegren, uh, who you saw a moment ago. Uh, then just some of my colleagues waiting for this to start. And this is the last of the, uh, the photo snippets, uh, uh, a little bit of uh, the pomp and circumstance of the award ceremony.
so anyway, uh, Crown Princess Victoria gave out uh, all of the uh, uh, the prizes, the the medals, the gold medals that uh, went with uh, the Crawford Prize, uh, and then the ceremony ended. Uh, here she's uh, walking out with uh, Dan Larhammer. Uh, there was a banquet then uh, that evening, a reception after the banquet. Here's uh, uh, Crown Princess Victoria with. Uh, uh, me and my family. This is uh, my son Nathan, uh, and my son Ben, and Margaret, of course, um, and uh, and then that was it. It was over. Uh, the next day, we went on to Stockholm, um, at least in part because my family wanted to see Stockholm, but I had arranged uh, for speaking events uh, in Stockholm uh, as well. Uh, and so uh, once we got there, uh, I had a uh, a meeting. Actually, this was something that. I was quite surprised the ambassador uh, asked for, because the the embassy looks at all of the things for US government employees anyway, uh, for travel and the travel permissions and so forth. And so they had seen that that an NIH employee was, was coming to Sweden for an award. And so he asked to see me. And so I gave him a, a mini lecture on auto-inflammatory diseases and, and we met uh, at the embassy. Uh, and then I gave a talk at the Karolinska Institute, and then that was it. It was over. And uh, finally, the last thing that that some people ask me is, well, what did you do with all of that money? Uh, well, I haven't spent it all, uh, at least yet. Uh, but one of the things that I thought was really a good thing to do uh, is to establish a, a set of awards myself uh, that, uh, that I've uh, donated money for. Uh, to the International Society of Systemic, Systemic Autoinflammatory Diseases. And these awards are named after some of the people who are the real heroes of mine uh, in some of the things that I've done. Uh, Jörg Chop, uh, shown here on the left, who was the discoverer of the inflammasome. Uh, Isabel Tuatu, uh, who was actually one of my arch rivals uh, in finding the gene for FMF. Mordechai Pras, uh, who was uh, my... Uh, very uh, important uh, collaborator and the, the father actually of the loan process uh, in uh, getting samples from patients uh, with FMF. Alberto Martini, uh, who's uh, in Genoa and, and uh, has led a large consortium of pediatric uh, rheumatology uh, clinical trials, and Charles Dinarello. Uh, and so the idea is that younger people in the field will get these awards named after these people that are more senior and and uh, some of my heroes uh, from the past. So with that, it's over. Um, and uh, I think that we're over right at the hour. So I apologize for maybe going a little over. I guess I can make the excuse uh, that I played all of those videos. And so that's what actually took up all of the time. But I just thought that it would be fun because it really was a smorgasbord of science, and and it was really fantastic, you know, having the opportunity to hear what these other guys uh, were doing too, and and uh, certainly, I think in the future they should actually consider uh, having combined uh, ceremonies again. So, in any event, uh, with that, I will call it to a close. Paul, uh, if you want to, uh, if there are any questions, I'll try to answer them, or if they're not, uh, everybody can uh, leave a little bit early for the weekend. Yeah, thank you, Dan, very much. This is a fantastic, you know, quite a royal treat, if you will, and um, that uh, we're so proud of you and all the great achievements you have made and, um, you know, making us all, you know, feel like, you know, we're among the, you know, the best uh, in science. And uh, you mentioned, you know, they were the Royal Academy, you know, they're they're impressed by NIH. I thought they were you were going to say they were impressed by how many great scientists we have here. But you know, <laughs> we're, we're, we do have a you know great you know regulations. But uh, you know, uh, I hope you convey that you know obviously we exemplify what the intramural scientists can do. Indeed, indeed. Okay, I think it's. Um, I do have some questions, but I can ask you later. But I don't want to hold you know people on a Friday afternoon. But uh, you know this is um, you know um, very impressive, and um, I uh, I think you know we're we're probably call the close, and uh, I'll email you with some of the questions I have you know 
and uh, this is a you know, really um, quite an important discovery and um, um, thank you very much well thank you paul thank very you much. and thank you all for for being here this afternoon as well yeah. yeah i'm sure a lot of people you know sending their congratulations to you and um, including some here in the, in the q a okay thank you very much take care bye-bye bye-bye everybody thank you for attending <laughs>